Hi, it's Aaron. I hope you're having a good day. Um, as I mentioned in my 2019 Year in Books video, I set a goal for this year to read 40 books um, by the end of the year, which would boil down to 10 books per quarter. Well, in quarter one of this year, I only read eight books, which puts me like two behind schedule. However, that's not a big deal because it's much more important what you're reading than the amount you're reading. The amount of books you're reading should never really be viewed as a a metric that gives much information besides that you've read a lot. Um, what's much more important is that you read and understand what you're reading. And really the goal, the purpose of a large number or just a number in general for a amount of books at X time span is really just to enforce that you keep the habit of reading going uh, because to meet the goal, you're gonna have to keep the habit going. So that's the entire purpose of having a 40 books in a year goal. It's not really that reading X amount of books make, makes you somehow smarter in any way. Uh, I mean, in mind it's a byproduct, but not inherently. <laughs> um, in this video, I intend to talk about the eight books that I've read thus far this year in hopes that uh, at least one of them will pique your interest and you'll pick it up and give it a read. Um, if you don't want to watch the entire video, that's pretty understandable because it's going to be like 20 to 30 minutes, I think. So what would be much smarter for you to do is to go to the description and see the um, timestamp for the book that sounds most interesting to you. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince is the first book that I read this year. And by read, I guess I mean the first book that I finished this year, because I started it at the end of 2019 in the last week or so, um, and finished it within the first few days of this year. Um, what I really like about it, which makes it my second favorite Harry Potter book, is that it really builds the world and propels the story at the same time. The book begins with the new Minister of Magic meeting up with the Prime Minister of England. Uh, which is something that hasn't occurred before, and it really helps to put the story in more of a macro scale rather than the microscope we had on Hogwarts and the Wizarding World beforehand. Now we have a grander view of how the actions in the Wizarding World and the happenings in the Wizarding World affect the world on the broader scale and the ripple effects that come out of that, which is really interesting to see unfold. Um, this book also, which does something that this story, for the Harry Potter story, really needed, which is give more backstory to Voldemort, because preceding this book, the backstory was just essentially, man, this guy's evil. He does evil stuff. Can you believe how evil this guy is? Um, and that is, this book doesn't detract from his evilness, but it gives some context for it and some uh, backstory, which can lead to some understanding to an extent, um, not to rationalize anything that <laughs> occurs by Voldemort for it by any means. Um, but it's really nice to have a villain where you can at least have a backstory and understanding of what is propelling them and what their motives are. Because without that, evil for the sake of evil is a lot less interesting uh, of a villain. Not that it can't be a good villain and still be evil for the sake of evil just as a foil, but it's for a longer drawn out story, I think it's necessary that a villain has some more context to them. Um, another thing going for this book, besides the expansion of Voldemort's backstory, is there's a constant sense of mystery throughout it about the attempted murderers that are ha attempted murders that I mean that are happening at Hogwarts and um, who and why and what are propelling those for it, which helps to I guess give a sense of intrigue to everything that happened in the middle points of the book. Because I think some of the earlier books really stumbled in the middle points. And by stumbled, I don't really mean it was bad. It was just kind of... It had a lull. It was like a valley between two peaks, I guess. Uh, the middle points, which was usually filled with the gang having classes. And then maybe some shenanigans in the middle. But usually nothing too crazy. Um, but this book kind of picks it up a notch, which is nice. Um, and what I think really makes this my second favorite Harry Potter book behind Prisoner of Azkaban. Is that... Um, well, it doesn't have any amazing peaks. It has a really nice, consistent tone that carries everything forward, and everything comes to its natural conclusion in a way that makes sense. Um, while the conclusion isn't clear until you get there, it, in retrospect, everything makes sense with how you got from point A to point B, and the ride in the middle is pleasant throughout, which is really all you can expect from a good fiction book, and that's what this is. Um, while The Prisoner of Azkaban, I think, has all of that, plus some high peaks that are just amazing. Um, but this book is really good throughout, and it's worth reading.
Einstein's Dreams by Alan Lightman is an interesting collage of short stories. Um, this is a book that I got for Christmas in 2018. Um, but before then, I had read a few excerpts from it uh, as part of my Philosophy 101 course, which was a great class. Um, and what's really interesting about this book is that it's not written by a fiction writer. It's written by Alan Lightman, who's a theoretical physicist. Um, this book is a fictional collage of stories dreamed by Albert Einstein during his time as a patent officer. Um, and most of the stories in here are basically themed around worlds that have different time-space relations than ours do. Um, for example, there's one world where the far, where you are gravitationally affects your time. And the further you are from center, um, center of gravity, such as the Earth, uh, the slower time goes, just by a very slim margin. So you have people who are um, have the means to, that are living on mountaintops to have a longer life. And then on the mountaintop next to them to have a longer life than the people on the other mountaintop. You have people who are putting their houses on these um, wooden support beams of sorts as to get their house even further elevated so that their life goes by even slower. Well, not that it goes, yeah, that it goes by slower so that it's longer. Um, but on the other side, we have people who are going down to the center of the earth, or not to the center of the earth, it's not journey to the center of the earth, starring Brendan Fraser. Um, but we have people who are going down um, to the, like, to land and swimming and enjoying the lakes and enjoying the land down there and making something and enjoying their active life down there. And it really makes you pause and think and think, well, is it worth having a longer life where you don't do much because you're trying to stay away from the earth or is it worth exploring and doing stuff and maybe having a shorter life um because of it and while that isn't the main point of the story which actually i guess that, that's the main point of that sub story um this book is filled with little five page stories like that that are rather thought-provoking and it's something that i would describe in the most pretentious way possible <laughs> as meditative fiction i guess where uh, i i think the most i got something out of this book that i really enjoyed um, because after reading five pages or so, I would stop and take a few minutes before I continued reading to like really try to understand how I would interplay in a world that describes such as that. Um, and just for that, I think this is a really thought-provoking book and a rather entertaining one um, to read on like a Saturday, over a weekend, like a Saturday and Sunday. Um, I really recommend reading Einstein's Dreams by Alan Lightman. Wild at Heart by John Eldridge is a book that I have mixed opinions on. I started to try reading it last August, and I didn't pick up any steam with it, partially due to the first third of the book definitely being my least favorite part of the book. Um, the book is subtitled Discovering the Secret of a Man's Soul. It's a uh, cr book about Christian masculinity, um, which can be a semi-charged topic, I would assume. <laughs> um, and I would, I would half-heartedly recommend this book with some qualifying statements. Um, this book is filled, at least the first third, is filled with uh, typical conservative evangelical views on gender, etc. that lead to some odd political implications, and they have some weird arguments for them that I don't think are very sound. Um, and also the first third of the book is mostly focused on masculinity that is portrayed in movies such as Braveheart and spends a lot more time kind of idolizing uh, William Wallace from Braveheart rather than um, Jesus Christ and for a book about Christian masculinity that's kind of odd I would say um but there's I mean it, it builds an argument for why it's doing that I just don't buy into it um you can read it and find out for yourself if you want to buy into that part of the book but after the first third of the book my opinion um changes a lot I think it's actually pretty great after that there's still some odd political implications that you can ignore or you can really get uh, hung up on uh, by and large i just read past them to get to what was in this book that i found engaging and worthwhile and i guess the central thesis of this book is that um most people or most men have some semi-traumatic experience um that leads to the creation of a false self or a facade um that is embraced throughout daily life that leads to uh an incessary to daily life and 
thusly a corrosion of one's soul due to living a lie. Um, which I'm not 100% sure if I even buy into, but I think it's a really useful idea to keep in mind. And, and it doesn't really need to be, I guess, spurred on by some traumatic event, but in the book it's portrayed that way, as in a wound that you aren't aware of that is uh, still haunting you that you need to reckon yourself with. And I think that's a really interesting concept that leads to some self-reflection. And for that, this book's worth reading. Um, I found it worth reading for that. Um, but also, if you don't have the patience to get through the first third of this book, which is rather mediocre, I guess, to bad. Mediocre to bad is how I describe the first third of this book. And I guess you can tell based off the way I've kind of put notes in here. Most of them are in the latter half of the book, because I think that's where useful information starts to come in. So if you're a Christian guy who's willing to look past some semi-misguided politics, then I'd give this a read. And they're semi-misguided politics, in my view. If you believe them or buy into those arguments, have at it, it I support you in that. Harry Potter and the Death of the Hallows is a good book. I like it. But <laughs> it's definitely one of my least favorite Harry Potter books, which uh, which is a statement that means it's a good book, but within a subset of books, it's falling on the lower end of that. I think it's definitely a bottom three Harry Potter book if I were to rank them, which I don't have a definitive ranking because that changes with my mood a bit, but a few spots here and there. But um, yeah, this is definitely one of my lesser books in the series. And I, I think that's because, in my mind, Harry Potter is at its best when it's driven by character and dialogue and mystery and intrigue. And most of this book is driven by action and spectacle, which is driving everything forward. Which sounds kind of weird, because I said in my previous segment on The Half-Blood Prince that I liked how that had a nice driving sense of movement. It was a steady driving sense of movement. This one is oscillating between slow and erratically fast um, in Deathly Hallows, which leads to a kind of disjointed read in the middle part. Um, the action sequences in this book, as in all the action sequences in the Harry Potter books, are kind of written in a way that makes them impossible to follow. At least for me. And what I mean by that is I'll read an action sequence. I'll be confused as of how we got from point A to point B in the action sequence. with From the starting point to the consequences of it. So I'll reread it. And I still won't understand the middle point because I don't think the action is written well. Um, so I'll essentially just read the conclusion of the action portion. And say, okay, I'm going to proceed reading with this fact in mind. That because of this action, this person died. Um, which just isn't really enjoyable. So I don't really like reading the action sequences in Harry Potter, and I think this book definitely has the most of them, uh, which is a shame, because this book does a good job of wrapping everything up. Uh, it, it all makes sense. There's no loose ends that aren't accounted for that I can think of. Uh, everyone acts in a way that aligns with their character up until then, which is great. It's just there's no further character development that really occurs in this book. It's mostly just wrapping up the loose ends, which is a necessary thing. It's just not what I find most enjoyable about the Harry Potter books. Atomic Habits by James Clear is the book to read for actionable information on habit formation and implementation. And I use the word actionable for a reason, because a lot of the research in this book is pulled from another book which gives a more theoretical approach to habit implementation formation, which is The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, uh, which gives a, which presents the reader with uh, kind of a loop, a habit loop for how habits work, where you have a cue, which leads to a response that you've associated with that cue, and then the response leads to a reward, which is associated with the cue, which is what makes it habitual. So building on top of that framework, James Clear in Atomic Habits says, that you should try to make that cue as obvious and attractive as possible in your response as easy as possible and the reward as satisfying as possible to make it all stick. And on top of that, he also says that habit change should much be more about identity change rather than just performing an action every day or every whatever, however, whatever time increment it is. It, instead of saying that you want to run every day, you should say that you are a runner and you want to become a runner. 
that way you have a kind of built-in stake in this where you're presenting yourself as having a certain identity so you have to do the actions to lead to it a lot of this book is about building fail safes where you basically are at a detriment to yourself if you don't perform the habit that you want to ingrain and this gives a lot of actionable strategies for how you can do that um, and this book's pretty gripping all the way through except for the last 60 pages or so where it veers into the topic of mastery which just kind of feels like a weird tonal shift and kind of out of place and it honestly feels a bit tacked on to the book to add length perhaps i'm not sure so i'm not going to speculate beyond that um but besides that it's a rather good read and it has some actionable information so if you're interested in forming habits highly recommend The Power by Naomi Alderman is a book that I have lent to a friend and do not have with me, so just imagine that I'm holding it in my hand right now. <laughs> but, you know, it's a uh, science fiction book with a feminist narrative, I guess you could say. It's definitely the first piece of feminist fiction that I've read that I was aware of, and I rather enjoyed it. I heard it recommended on a podcast and picked it up on a whim because I saw it at my uh, school's bookstore. And it's a book that is told from multiple different perspectives. And within it, the teenage girl population, that's a weird way to describe it, but the teenage girls in the world um, develop this ability to shoot electricity out of their fingers, um, which leads to a rather jarring change in gender dynamics, which leads to an interesting exploration of power and what it means for a group to have power over another group. And the overall thesis of the book, I'd say, is that uh, a power imbalance, whether it intends to or not, will lead to an oppression of some sort, um, which I think is a narrative or an idea that I can generally buy into on a broader scope. Um, and I think it's a rather interesting perspective to take, at least, and it's, I think it's a perspective that's worth acknowledging and understanding and entertaining the thoughts of. Um, and for an interesting way to do that, in a rather entertaining way to entertain those thoughts, I recommend reading The Power by Naomi Alderman. Range by David Epstein is a book that I wanted to like. I really did. Um, but it kind of let me down. I first heard about the book when the author was interviewed on the podcast Next Big Idea, and that episode is worth listening to if you can find it. Uh, it's probably all you need to listen to, and you don't need to read this book. I really don't mean to disparage this book that much, but I, I don't hate this book, let me put it that way. Um, but I wouldn't recommend it. Its main idea is that it's better to be a jack of all trades, uh, gain a wide field of knowledge, and then kind of meld those disparate pools of information together to create something new, uh, rather than to uh, specialize early or prematurely which is an idea that I hope is true and that I'd like to buy in, that it is better to be a jack of all trades and then figure out a new connection that you can make in a unique way uh, to make your own path. However, this book doesn't present that argument well, in my opinion. Uh, like many pop psychology books, it seems like it starts with its thesis and then works backwards to make the book, rather than the uh, evidence points in this book building naturally to that conclusion. A lot of the, all, almost all the anecdotes in this book are people who are resounding ex successes with the use of this uh, generalist idea rather than this specialist idea. Um, and I would just really appreciate if the author, when making this book, put in some counter points to his, uh, to his thesis, or at least had some anecdotes about people who aren't resounding successes, um, just some average Joes who are doing well with this approach rather than the people who are hitting home runs on the daily with this approach. Uh, this book focuses a lot on Vincent Van Gogh's and not average Joes, which is just kind of annoying, I guess. I think it just leads to a lack of credibility in the argument that's being made, even though I do believe it's probably true, and I do believe that there was some solid research done before this was written to kind of make sure that it was true before this started went into being made however the book itself doesn't paint that picture you have to infer that which is kind of annoying the plot against america by philip roth is a pretty decent piece of historical fiction in which the famed anti-semitic pilot charles Lindbergh runs for and beats franklin delano roosevelt for president in 1940 on a platform of isolationism and staying out of World War II. 
Uh, it's a book that I had some preconceived notions about, which definitely hurt my opinion of it or hurt my experience with it, I would say. Uh, a lot of these preconceived notions come due to reading the book How Democracies Die, in which this book is kind of used as a uh, reference point for how a party, a political party, can be corrupted from the inside and lead to a different conclusion by operating within the existing system and kind of subverting it within. Uh, and that's what this, according to How Democracies Die, that's what this book was about, Charles Lindbergh doing that with the Republican Party in the United States, um, which is which occurs in this book. Um, but I wouldn't say it's what this book is about. So this book is not a political thriller. Um, it's much more about a Jewish family living in New Jersey while that stuff is occurring in the background and while this subversion, subverting of the government to become an oppressive institution against the Jewish population is occurring in the background. But that's, it's not a political thriller, it's much more a slice of life-esque story. So if you're into slice of life type stuff, I'd highly recommend this because that's what 70% of this book is. And once I realized that's where this book was heading, I enjoyed it a lot. But the issue I had beforehand was I thought the book was too slow. So I was thinking, okay, when is it going to get to what the meat and potatoes of the book, where this is a political thriller, um, which just this book isn't. So if you go into this book understanding what to expect, um, it's going to be pretty good. So I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. I really appreciate it, and I hope that you found a book that is of some interest to you that might ignite the uh, new desire for you to start reading, especially during this time of quarantine when we don't have much to do. Perhaps you want to develop the reading habit by picking up Atomic Habits and making reading the habit you develop. Just a thought. Either way, if you read any of these books and have any thoughts on them, I'd love to hear them, so please share.